is awesome. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning on this Reformation Sunday. We are really glad that you are here to worship God with us. I'm Pastor Judy, and uh, it's great to be able to worship with you, whether it's in person like now or whether it's online or on the radio. Special guests to all, a special welcome to all guests that are here this morning. If you'd like to learn more about First Lutheran, connect up with Pastor Kerry or myself after worship, or fill out a connection card that's in back um, or online. Everything you need is going to be in your little handout and in the hymn book that's uh, underneath the seat in front of you. And a special thanks to the choir and to the musicians uh, and to all of you who are making worship possible this morning, along with our hospitality team. Our uh, sermon series this morning uh, continues with Hinge Moments, focusing on significant moments in our lives that have shaped our faith and our lives. Let us center our hearts to worship as we live in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as you are able as we sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a song written by Martin Luther over 500 years ago who led the Reformation. I'm going to invite you to sing verses 1, 2, and 4, and the choir will sing verse 3.
Lutherans, we can say that, you know. It's a good thing. We know that we mess up and that we're not perfect. And so we seek God for forgiveness and grace. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another, pausing in silent reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we might delight in your world and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of the Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray the prayer together. God of all sorrows, you give us many reasons to praise you. Help us to recognize your majesty around us and show us your heart in this time and place that we might worship you with joy and gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and I invite the children to come forward and if, for those of you at home, I invite you to gather your kids and join Pastor Carrie as we sing, Jesus Loves Me. the kids young at heart too you know it's not about age <laughs> oh this is great well kids at home we are glad that you've joined us and as you can see we have some young at heart up here for children's time today and today in just a little bit we're going to hear a story of a man named Solomon who built a temple which was a place to worship God and um Solomon really wanted that temple to be amazing. So I'm going to give you guys some magnetiles, and I want to see how, what kind of amazing structure you can create with, with all of these pieces. And, you know, there's more if you need them. And maybe some of you guys at home have these magnetiles too, and you'll go get them and see what kind of, what kind of awesome building you can create um, as you listen to the rest of worship. But in Solomon's temple, this house that he imagined for God, he made it as fancy and as special as he possibly could. And I, I doubt that any of you or any of you have uh, gold walls at home or uh, things like that. But, but when it came to that temple, Solomon 
just made it really, really fancy and special because he thought God deserved such an amazing place. But after many years, unfortunately, that temple was destroyed. And so it's not there anymore. It's like someone came along and wrecked Jeff's temple. <laughs> and yet, it shows us that that. It's not the place that matters. The reason God sent Jesus was to remind us that Jesus now lives in us and through us. That our temple, um, our body becomes that temple for where God lives and dwells. And so when we come to worship at church, it's because we are here together that matters, not necessarily the place. As we go out uh, to school or daycare or wherever we, uh, you guys don't go there. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> God is with you there as well. And so that is something to celebrate and remember today. And let's pray that God made this possible for, for us to be that temple for God's spirit. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for sending us Jesus and your Holy Spirit to remind us of your love, help us to be your temple and to share the love you've given us with others. And all God's children said, Amen. <laughs>
The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God as the Lord said to my father David, your son whom I will set on your throne in your place shall build the house for my name. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the ark. So they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark so that the cherubim made a covering over the Ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able for the gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to John, chapter, chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? but he was speaking of the temple of his body. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Carrie, and it's great to have you with us for worship this morning. Well, as Pastor Judy mentioned at the beginning of our worship, uh, today we are wrapping up our sermon series called Hinge Moments. And my hope is that even as we do, you take this idea of paying attention to those moments in your life that mark a move from where you've been to where you're going. As a whole, this series has helped us uh, give vo words or a voice to the reality that transition is a long process. That takes many months, sometimes years, and it's actually a regular part of our life as we move from one season to another, whether it be in our work or in our family 
or in our relationship with God. In contrast, change is more instantaneous often, and there are changes that we seek out as well as those changes that we don't. But those times in our lives when we uh, cross a threshold of sorts, or when a particular change awaken us more to God's presence in our life, those are the hinge moments that orientate the rest of our life as well. Several weeks ago, as we kicked off this series, we looked at the story of God and Moses and the way that God provided manna for the people in the wilderness. And in that story, we were reminded of how God sends blessings even when people, when we, complain or grumble. As you may recall, the newly freed people of Israel found themselves in a frightening uh, situation, walking in the wilderness without enough food, It unnerved them and made them anxious because they couldn't see quite what would happen. And they expressed this fear by complaining, wishing that they were back in Egypt. This was a hinge moment for them. They were in a period of transition, and as we all know, transition isn't usually easy or stressless or entirely smooth. But God showed up for them, and despite their lack of faith, God provided for them and gave them exactly what they needed. And this, in that way, this story is good news for us as well. When we move through our own transitions or can't quite see uh, the, the, the where um, that God is calling us to. The following week in the story of Samuel, we were reminded of how God blesses and equips us to do great things. Samuel was just a young boy, as you remember, when God called him to be a prophet. And this is one of those examples that shows how God often calls the person we would least expect. But how God also always equips the person that is called with the skills to follow God's calling. In the same way, God calls us to do great things throughout our life and provides us with the talents and skills that we need to accomplish God's mission in the world. At the same time, this story of the calling of Samuel reminds us of how important listening to and for God in our lives is, and maybe especially when we're going through a time of transition. There's no doubt that discerning God's voice and praying, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, was a hinge moment for Samuel, as well as for Eli. And the same can be true for us when we pray that same prayer. Then last week, Pastor Greg preached on the story of the calling of David, and that story also shows how God sees beyond the exterior of ourselves to what is within our hearts. In our fast-paced world, we too often dismiss someone or something based on a quick or first impression. In our story last week, we saw how the prophet Samuel made that same mistake, only for God to tell him that God judges people based upon their hearts, not their outward appearances. In that way, this was a hinge moment for Samuel as well as for David and for all of God's people as they welcomed a leader that was different from who or what they were looking for or expecting. On a personal level, I think this story is also a great reminder that God calls us based on what's in our hearts as well. Seeing past what our society values and instead sees us for who we truly are deep down inside. And now finally, this week we have the story of Solomon building the temple. A completion of a dream of of his father David and a story that you may not um, read from or hear about very often. As we heard in a nutshell, this story shows how, like Solomon, we give the best of ourselves when we work to fulfill the callings that God's placed in our lives. God called King Solomon to build a temple that would be a physical reminder for all of God's people that God dwells with and among them. In fulfilling that call, Solomon spared no expense, as I shared at children's time, and on the day of its dedication, all of Israel came to watch. So, like them, we too are called to share God's presence with the world. As in the uh, story of the calling of Samuel, we're given talents and gifts that we can put to use when fulfilling God's calling in our lives. And the thing about the pursuit of this calling, though, is that 
of the, this calling and maybe even a desire to serve God as best we can is that it often leads to hinge moments, which then bring with them seasons of transition, which then bring with them all sorts of emotions, some exhilarating and others unnerving. As I said before, transition is rarely without its challenges, and even changes we seek out can leave us feeling a combination of nerves and excitement. But that's another reason why the story of Solomon in the temple is an important one in our life of faith. And that's the way that remembrances of Solomon's temple call us to wholehearted worship in our lives. In our gospel reading, Jesus makes that connection between his own body and the temple, and in that way changes the way that we think about where we worship. In the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well, you may remember that when the woman at the well asked a question about worship to Jesus, Jesus explained that worship isn't about a specific place or even a specific building, but it's rather a matter of spirit and truth. And so this way of thinking is an invitation to consider in our own lives whether our worship and the way we live mirror those ideals of wholehearted worship, that, that God's in us and lives through us, which can, as one person pointed out, be boiled down to Jesus' commandments to love God, others, and oneself. In that way, I can't help but think that the invitation in our story this morning is to think about the way that we worship and that greatest commandment and how it can guide us and center us through times of transition and change. What can help us as we go through a transition in our lives or center us as you pay attention for God's presence and take notice of those hinge moments. Those moments when God is doing a new thing or inviting you to transition from where you've been to where you're going. A new reality or future, perhaps. There's no doubt that there are many spiritual practices that can guide us in this work. There's the practice of examine where you spend a bit of time each day or week reflecting on where you've seen God, what has been life-giving, and where you feel challenged and then bringing those things to God in prayer. There's the ancient practice of Lectio Divina, or contemplative reading, where you read a passage of scripture a few times with some silence in between, and and consider what God might be saying to you through that passage. There's the simple yet not easy practice of mindful breathing, in which that the invitation is to focus our breath on, on just on the simple and the simple way that that um, helps us connect to the one who gives us breath and helps us connect with God's presence in our life. And there are, of course, many others as well. Yet today, what I want to leave you with this morning is something you may not um, have thought of before. It's something that isn't necessarily a spiritual practice, but it is something that influences how we look at the world and those around us that might even awaken us more to the presence of God in, with, and among us as we navigate times of transition and change in our lives. And this, this idea that I'm leaving you with is, is based on a video that I recently saw featuring uh, um, Benjamin Zander, who is the director of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. In that video, Xander explains to um, his audience his teaching philosophy. And basically what he says is that when I teach in my classes, everyone gets an A. And the way that he unpacks that is by on the first day of class or, or maybe the second day, he has each of the students write a letter. And he has them start out, dear Mr. Xander, he has them date it the end of the term. And then in their letter, he asks them to describe for him why they deserve that letter grade of an A. And then he says, I teach the students described in those letters. And then he followed that up, I say, and so therefore, I only teach A students. Well, as I watched this video, I I found myself inspired and even a bit challenged by Benjamin Zander's philosophy. And 
how at one point in the video, I, I resonated when he explained how he viewed his job as awakening possibilities in others. And this notion, like I said, definitely spoke to me, and, and his philosophy definitely brought out the best in his students. But it also made me wonder, well, what difference might it make if we had Benjamin Zander's philosophy in mind in our interactions with others as well? What if we brought this mentality that everyone has already earned an A into the relationships and contexts that fill our days? So often we can be critical and we, we nitpick and we f focus on and what's not the way we want it, even in our own lives. So what if we extended this, this philosophy to those we don't yet know, or those we disagree with, or simply those who rub us the wrong way? That they're already complete, that they already have what they need to, to be the person God's created them to be. And then what difference might it make in being able to recognize God and to live into God's calling of loving God with all we've got and loving our neighbors as ourselves if this was the approach we brought to the world? It might not surprise you to hear me say this, but what if we first extended this to ourselves as well? After all, as with so many things, that is where things start. And in so many ways, we can't offer to others what we don't have ourselves. So again, what difference might it make if you started your day with the thought that God has already deemed you an A, that God has already made you enough and will give you what you need to fulfill God, the calling that God's placed on your life? As it's been for God's people throughout the centuries, there are times when the work that we are called to, or the way that we are called to use our gifts changes. Times when we move from serving in one way to serving in another, or when God invites us to change course or turn in a new direction. But always, God does this in order to, for us to live more fully into the abundant life that God makes available to us. And so no matter what particular way we serve God or live out the calling that we've received, our first and foremost calling is always this, beloved child of God. And the way I see it, this is our shared calling as well. The one that is defined by loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And when we do that, we can embrace all the transition and changes that come our way with a spirit of openness, with trust and confidence, knowing that God is leading the way and God will provide. So with that in mind, I want to leave you with this thought by St. Francis de Sales, who writes, Do not look forward to what may happen tomorrow. The same everlasting Father will take care of you tomorrow and every day. Either he will shield you from suffering or he'll give you unfailing strength to bear it. So be at peace. Put aside all anxious thoughts and imaginations, and say continually, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart has trusted in him, and I am helped. He is not only with me, but in me, and I in him. In the name of Jesus, amen.
please rise as you are able as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find it in the beginning of your hymn book on page number 105. Together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Recognizing that we can't do it alone, we turn to God in prayer. After I end my petition with, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to say, hear our prayer. God, as your people and as a church, we drift and we lose our way. Continually draw us back to you and shape our hearts and our lives. Open us up to love and serve our neighbor extravagantly, daring to care for the poor, to give witness to the gospel, and to share all that we have no matter what, so that others might experience your love and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You have blessed each one of us within this faith community and beyond with many different gifts, gifts of hospitality, of leadership, cooking and baking, organizing and music, helping others, listening, teaching, creativity, communication, technology, medical skills, problem solving, planting and growing and harvesting, praying, caring, advocating, comforting, and oh so much more. Help us to recognize and share our gifts freely in love for our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy. Restore us and transform our relationship with you and all of creation bringing us into a living harmony of mind, body, and spirit. Teach us to live in harmony with our surroundings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are in need and all who are lonely, rejected, or feeling unloved. Comfort those who are grieving. Surround David Schultz and Marty and Heidi Schultz and family upon the death of Fran Schultz. Comfort them as they grieve their loss. Lord, in your mercy, may your presence be known to those who are ill. We pray especially for Bernetta, Oren, Byron, Lisa, Bonnie, Logan, Vernon, Patty, Linda, Verl, Nicole, Glenda, Judy, Roger, Jeff, Pauline, Rusty, and all in your need of your healing and grace, and those that we name silently now in our hearts. Bring healing, hope, and strength to all. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us by your spirit and send us out with courage and hope to share your love and grace to all. Trusting in your promises, we lift these prayers to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. During our offering time today, I'd like to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your engagement over this past year. Thank you to each one of you who have turned in your plan for giving uh, forms for this coming year. I, if you haven't already done so, it's not too late. You can place them in the offering boxes um, outside in the worship, uh, in the gathering space. 
Each fall, we ask you to help us make a plan for the coming year, and we know that there are many good organizations out there that are vying for your attention and your support these days. So we do not take it for granted. We don't take your support at all for granted, and we don't take you for granted. So we are still receiving these plan for giving and if by chance you haven't gotten one of these packets, you can find it at the Welcome Center that's out there um, or online. At this offering time, I'd also like to take a little opportunity to let you know how your support makes a difference as I, your pastor of congregation, care. Now, I don't do all the pastor congregation care. We've got Pastor Carrie and we've got Pastor... Greg, and other people that help with the care of individuals and families within this community. And so we are thankful for that, and your support makes that possible. So often I visit individuals who are going or have gone through some difficult challenges in their lives. Maybe they're dealing with a new or current or continuing diagnosis. Maybe they've lost a loved one. Or they're experiencing transitions like Pastor Kerry talked about and how some of those uh, transitions really are hinged moments in our faith. Over and over again as I visit people, I hear, I am blessed. I grew so much in the midst of my cancer. In the midst of the challenges that I have faced, I have grown closer to God. I have this wonderful opportunity closer to God. I have this wonderful opportunity to hear faith stories and how God has made and continues to make a difference in the lives of so many people. Yep, God is faithful and God is with us in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of transitions, in the midst of loss and grief. God journeys with us. I also get to see how God showed up and how God continues to show up. One day I visited somebody and flowers had showed up from First Lutheran Church. And it was a member who had been caring for this person during COVID by just making a phone call. Those phone calls, those cards sent, the invitations to be able to come and visit, to help, to care, to share, to be there, to be a listening um, ear. And sometimes just to be present makes all the difference in the world. So thank you for your generous support in this ministry and all the many different ministries. It's because of you lives are touched and changed and hope is shared. We couldn't be prouder to be church with you together. Together, we lift these gifts to God in prayer. God of all creation, all you made, and you alone endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the land. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be the world's signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let us pray together the prayer Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you leave this place, go forth with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a lot going on here, but first of all, I'd like to uh, say thanks to Carol uh, 
Rydell and family for sponsoring the radio broadcast in memory of Tim Rydell and for Dwayne and Judy Berger sponsoring today's live streaming in honor of their 50th wedding anniversary. Like I said, there's a lot going on. So today is the last day to sign up for Concordia Christmas concert on December 4th. And in order to make this trip happen, we need to be able to have six more people join this, uh, this trip and uh, being able to hear the Christmas concert. Um, and we need that uh, by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Otherwise, this uh, trip to hear this great Christmas concert will not be able to be possible. So if you already signed up, invite a couple friends. I mean, if six of you would each invite one more person along, we'd be able to go. So 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, call Gre Greg T. And then tonight is Trick and Treat at Calvary. Thanks for all your candy donations and for sharing your truck trunk and for greeting the kids tonight and sharing treats. And then stay informed with what's happening and plan to attend the congregational update that's happening on, December, on November 7th to learn more about the, where we are in the call process, our finances, and the proposed 2022 budget. Now, I know that finances and budgeting are not probably your number one thing that you want to attend, but it's really, really important. So show up. And then today, Pastor Kerry talked about sharing your gifts and those hidden moments that engage us and maybe call us to something new and different. And so if connecting and building relationships is one of your gifts and gives you joy, we invite you to join us on November 9th for an informational meeting and to consider being a Faith Lutheran ambassador. That is one person who connects and welcomes guests at worship. It's pretty easy. At least for those extroverts. Introverts, we'll find other things for you to do. <laughs> but maybe you can stretch yourself. And as our church grows, larger, small groups become more and more important as ways to connect. So we have Advent small groups, and that's going to be a great way for you to get to know others and to grow in your faith. The signups are on the table out there in the Welcome Center, so there's all kinds of opportunities of time and day. Uh, so sign up and be a part of that. And then we have wreath making that's coming up in November. So see the E! News or online for all your details and all the other exciting things that are happening here. And that's the end for today's announcements. That was a lot. You got it all? Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. Thank you, choir, and everybody for wearing red for Reformation. Next Sunday, you can all wear red for All Saints Sunday. So now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And all God's children said? Amen. All right. Together, please rise as you are able as we sing number 654, The Church is One Foundation.